here today. I never miss an opportunity to do an infomercial. Um, and I want to bring the greetings of the Clinton Historical Society directors and leadership. Uh, it is ironically appropriate that our first program of the 2021 year is a Zoom <laughs> program. Um, we do have a number of programs that we're doing this year, despite the pandemic restrictions. Uh, and the next one we have coming up is, a, is in February on the 7th and the 21st. It's actually a two-parter. And that will be, uh, Dick Williams will be talking about the um, architectural style of residences, residence houses in uh, Clinton. So if you're into uh, architecture and want to know a little bit about architecture with a local flavor. Again, February 7th and 21st, we will be pushing out notice on that uh, through the media. We will also be posting on Facebook and a YouTube channel where you will be able to find all of these programs. Uh, fingers crossed that we can po post them within a week of them happening. So um, the other thing I wanted to say is that um, we welcome all participants. We both a from a volunteer standpoint, a membership support standpoint, and we encourage everybody to uh, follow us on Facebook, provide us with your uh, email addresses so that uh, we can get you into the loop. We're starting to get into the 21st century with, um, with media and uh, contacting people and certainly be checking us out on our website, uh, uh, clintonhistory.org. So I guess what I will do right now is you've endured the uh, infomercial part of the program. Kathy Collette, uh, who is our speaker today, is a local historian and uh, recently retired archivist uh, at Hamilton College. She has a keen interest in local biographies and brings with her several years of experience in and historical research experience. Uh, in addition to her 19 years in archival work at Hamilton College, she was an adjunct lecturer at George Washington University, a, um, a lecturer at Mount Holyoke College. She holds a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in medieval studies and a master's from University of Cambridge and a bachelor's from Wesley College. Um, Wellesley. And, I'm sorry? Wellesley. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, okay, sorry. I am terrible. That's what it said. That's it's what it said. I was conflating. My apologies. <laughs> she is also uh, 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 was one of our featured speakers last year covering the life and times of Clinton scholars. So uh, without further delay, I will hand it over to the capable hands of uh, Kathy, Catherine Collette. Um, and please, again, if you would mute yourselves uh, and do participate in the chat room so we can get questions, but please mute yourself until such time as it will be, we will be opening up for questions. So I will shut up now. Kathy, it's yours. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, so what's going to happen is I'm going to share my screen and play the recording, which is my commentary and the, um, the presentation, the, the PowerPoint presentation, all pre-recorded. Um, so, and as, as uh, Jim said, you can put your questions in the chat or just save them till, till afterwards when we will go back to the live um, uh, you know, screen where we can see each other and everything. Um, so this presentation is about Rush Palmer Cady, a young man who fought against a previous insurrection that threatened our country. So it's somewhat timely. And I will go ahead and share my screen and start the recording. Let's see, here we go. Hi, I am Kathy Collett. I am the mostly retired archivist at Hamilton College. I am not a, an expert on the Civil War or even on Rush Palmer Cady himself, but I hope to be able to guide you through 
what the Hamilton College Archives holds about KD and his life. So this is a presentation about Rush Palmer KD at Hamilton College and in the Civil War. Okay, here's a brief bio of Rush Palmer Katie from the Archives Accession Database. He gives a brief overview of his life. He lived from 1841 to 1863. He came to Hamilton College as a sophomore in 1859 and left in 1861 to join the Army. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant, became a first lieutenant after Fredericksburg, was mortally wounded at Gettysburg in July 1863. The photograph here belonged to Cynthia Barnes, who generously donated it to the Hamilton College Archives. There are three main collections with material from Rush Cady and his family. I'll go through each of them. And that's a, a picture of some of the materials in the archives with uh, the, some of the Rush Cady materials are over on the left on the top shelves there. Okay, the first collection is the Civil War collection of letters, mostly from Rush Cady. It was given by Cynthia Barnes of Westmoreland, who's a great, great niece of Rush Cady. Her mother, Elizabeth Prescott, was the great granddaughter of Rush's sister, Eliza, who was his next younger sister, um, just a, a year or two younger than, than Rush, and um, they were very close. The Rush Palmer Katie and Katie family papers, also from Cynthia Barnes, were donated in 2010. These include diaries from various periods of Rush's life, also family papers and correspondence. Much of this is not digitized. The letters in the previous collection are. And the 2019 collection is the diary of Rush Palmer Katie. Uh, which covers July to September 1860. It describes his su summer vacation that year. It was donated by Janet Fulmer Johnson, another great, great niece of Rush. Uh, Daniel Cady Fulmer, who was Rush's nephew, the son of his baby sister, Harriet Bell Cady, uh, was Janet's grandfather. So Rush was her great, great uncle. Let me also mention another collateral re re descendant, uh, Ro Robert Cady, who was great-grandson of Hiram Palmer Cady, who was born in 1850 near Clockville, Madison County, New York, which Rush himself was born um, in Clockville, which is, I guess, part of Lenox Township. Um, so Robert is likely some sort of cousin three times removed. Okay, so Hamilton College has resources that you might want to access, including the Civil War letters, which includes Russia's letters, uh, but also many, many other letters um, related to the Civil War. And this is part of the Digital Humanities Initiative. And there are yeah, letters and documents from many people. And you can access and read them here. If you put Rush Katie in the search box here, you will find all the letters and documents that are related to Rush Katie. Hamilton has more uh, resources that you might be interested in. Here's Morris Sisterman's article on uh, the Civil War in general, but it also includes several paragraphs about Rush Katie, going over his life. And Morris also wrote the book on Hamilton College's history, On the Hill, a bicentennial history of Hamilton College, which has this two-page spread on Rush Katie. Uh, the page on the left is a digital copy of one of the letters from Rush. Now let's start looking at the documents that we have. So the first collection mentioned, which is mostly letters, also includes a biography written not long after Russia's death, possibly by his father, Daniel Cady, but it seems more likely that it was sent, written by somebody else and sent to his father because his name is on the envelope. Um, 
So, you know, as it says here, uh, Rushkoff, Paul Mercator was born in the town of Lenox, but other sources say that he was born in Clockville, which, you know, they're basically the same, same area. He moved to Rome when he was four, and as a teenager, he established a newspaper with a friend, which the, the last paragraph there talks about, and this page ends with his going to college, and we'll get to that period in his life, but first, let's have a look at the diary that he was writing in 1858. So I'm going to read you the entry for April 22nd, 1858. So he says, Walking, walked down with father in the morning, went in chapel and studied as usual through the day at grandfather's with Osborne. Made very good progress in Virgil. Am reading about 400 lines each day, having nothing else to study. Intend to finish Virgil as soon as possible, then review four orations to Cicero, afterwards take up the Greek reader. Wrote letters to the treasurers of Amherst and Harvard colleges for catalogues. Bird C. Wade, who... It, is, appears in the Hamilton College catalog, so he was a couple years older than Rush, but um, was, was at Hamilton when, when Rush was. Came in to see me about three o'clock, stayed few minutes, would have come home with me, but I couldn't come as I was to go to a covenant meeting in the evening. Mother came down with grandfather at night to go to meeting. We went about seven o'clock. The meeting was very interesting. I had thought quite seriously of late. I had experienced religion previously a few days ago, and having made up my mind to live henceforth a religious life, I told my experience and asked to be received into the church. I was received. Larkin also came forward. Weather quite pleasant. It was moonlight. Father, mother, and I came home after meeting. So now let's look at what Hamilton College required upon entrance which note that one had to know both Latin and Greek uh, for entrance note. This wasn't what you learned there. You already had to know Latin and Greek to get into Hamilton, including the particular works he talks about. He talks about Virgil in that diary entry and Cicero's select orations and the Greek reader. Uh, so he was, he was preparing to come to college. Here's what he would have done uh, the, the, his sophomore year at, at Hamilton. He came in, he entered as a sophomore, and these are the things he would have studied in 1859-60. Here's some more bits from the catalog. The expenses, which are always interesting to see. Room rent, $3 per term, so $9 altogether, and so on. Um, you, we can see Russia's name on the list in the catalog. He um, you know, came from Rome. He lived in room 29, Hamilton Hall, which Hamilton Hall um, was what later became South. I think it was also called South, South College at some of the time then. And there's the calendar for, for that year. And here, in fact, is Hamilton Hall or Old South College before 1873, because in 1873 it was remodeled as Hungerford Hall, and then in 1906 it was torn down, and the new South College, now South Residence Hall, was built in its place. Now we're going to have a look at the diary he was writing in 1860. So this is his summer vacation, and um, this is a transcript by Janet Fulmer Johnson and her sister, Susan Fulmer Coyer, who both great-granddaughters of Harriet Bell Katie, the bell that's referred to in the, the first entry. Um, I'll read these for a few extracts to give you a sense not only of Rush and his life, but also what life was like around this time for a prosperous family. Note, as we go through, uh, Rush's socializing and going on visits with his uncle Gustavus, who was just two years older than him. So they were more like cousins than uncle and nephew. So, August 1st, returned from college a week ago last Friday on the 9 p.m. train, having stopped a few hours in Utica. Found our folks all in usual good help, health except little Belle. She had been sick for more than two weeks, some of the time not being expected to live. But now she was much better and gradually improving. Uncle Harry Katie was at our house and stayed overnight, returned home next morning. 
Eliza had not attended school during the latter half of the term on account of our moving, and it was well that she did not on account also of grandfather's death and the baby's sickness. Grandmother was as well as could be expected, sustaining with Christian fortitude her late severe affliction. Uncle Gustavus had just returned from a tour with Mr. White of some of the northern counties of the state, including Jefferson and Lewis, having had traveled with horse and carriage for the purpose of making the acquaintance of druggists in the various towns and villages and getting orders for his firm in New York, more than 180 miles. I felt really glad to get home so as to rest and enjoy myself and was quite delighted with the prospect of an eight weeks vacation to be spent in visiting and recreation with pleasure and profit. Monday, 23rd. Oh yes, this is, it says August 1st, which may be when he was actually writing it, but we're, we're now back on, on July 23rd is what he's talking about. A pleasant day. Grandmother and Gustavus started out today to spend the week in making a tour of Madison County with horse and carriage. Grandma thought it would be for her health to ride. She went to Canastota on the cars, so that's on the train. And he, with the horse father lately owned and sold to George Rufus, drove out to Can Canastota and met her there. Thought some of studying German for about four weeks of the vacation and had some conversation with an educated German named Hausmann in regard to it, but finally concluded that I should occupy my time wholly in recreation and let study go for the present. It is a rare privilege I have of exercising in the gymnasium, and I expect to improve it and thus improve myself while I remain at home. Thursday the 26th, went around town sometime with Joe during the afternoon, visiting the gymnasium and exercising some. We sparred in considerable, about equally matched. Wrote a letter to Miss Hattie Clark, which should have been written long ago. Have kept up our irregular correspondence with her for more than a year. Friday the 27th, went down to the depot in the morning to see Joe off on the 7 o'clock train. Spent some time, before 11 o'clock, writing a letter to Grandma Katie in answer to one received from her a few days ago, replying to all her inquiries in regard to Grandmother Palmer, mother, the baby, etc. Saturday, July 28th. At 3.32, Grandmother came home from Canastota, having been gone since Monday, went home with her and rendered her some assistance in setting the house in order. About 5 o'clock, Gustavus came with horse and carriage, Mrs. Sarah Palmer, lately widowed, accompanying him. He had drove from Lenox, Madison County, went with Eliza to the choir rehearsal at the church and sang till about nine o'clock. Monday, July 30th, called on Miss Hattie Clark at Fanny Mudge's during the forenoon. She came from New York on Saturday, intending to visit at Rome and places adjacent till the 1st of September. Was glad to see her. She looked very well indeed, had grown a little taller. She had been sick with the scarlet fe fever some time ago and was obliged to cut off her curls. Tuesday, July 31st. Before 10 o'clock, spent some time writing in my journal, then started off with Gustavus from Grandma's and walked up to the ridge after stopping a few minutes at Adam's Stone Mills and ordering a couple of barrows of flour. We went over and called on Mrs. Crosby, getting there about 11 o'clock and staying till one, having an excellent dinner and a first-rate visit. Mr. Crosby and Horace had gone huckleberrying, starting at six in the morning. Eliza was at school. Mrs. Crosby made it very pleasant for us. She is one of the best-hearted women I ever knew. We stopped at the ridge about an hour as it began to rain. Good prayer meeting in the evening. Skipping ahead to August 7th, about 3 o'clock, went up to Hyde's Woods with Uncle Nathan's horse and our carriage, taking Eliza, Hattie Clark, Annie Butts, and Fanny Mudge. Will Roberts also went up, taking Rose Butts, Addie Madison, and Miss Morehouse of Rochester. While there, in the woods, Eugene Madison, Frank Pope, Jerome Mudge, and Fred Armstrong came up and stayed a short time. We enjoyed ourselves very much walking around the woods and down by the river. Returned home soon after six o'clock. Wednesday, the 15th. This morning, Mr. Yates invited me to go with him to Waterville and Hamilton. He procured a team and light carriage, and we started a little before nine o'clock. Stopped a while at Hampton and also at Clark's Mills, visiting the store of F.D. Clark and also going around the mills. Made a short call on Miss Hattie Clark. Mrs. C. and Anna were not at home. We arrived at Clinton 12 o'clock and took dinner at the Clinton House, Bill Johnson proprietor. Mr. Yates called on a number of merchants with whom he was acquainted. Saw several Clinton friends. Soon after dinner, we went on the hill as that Mr. Yates might see the college buildings and grounds. Picked a quantity of flowers from my bed and pages. I presume this means they had, they were gardening as students saw Mr. Williams and gave some directions about repairing my room. 
By the way, before reaching Clinton, we stopped at Wicks a few moments. The old lady gave us a fine lot of apples. From the hill, we proceeded to Deansville, which we stopped, where we stopped a short time, and then went to Waterville, about four and a half miles further and eight miles from Clinton. Found it quite a place. Called on a number of the merchants in the evening with Mr. Yates. Put up at Mr. Lewis's hotel. A boil on my arm was quite troublesome. And I didn't include the entries for this, but after, after this, uh, in, towards the end of August, he went with his next sister, Eliza, to visit relatives and friends in Clockville and Syracuse for a few weeks. It was actually from August 12th to September 4th before he went back to college. So here's his next year at college. He's a junior. At this time, he's staying um, in room 23 of Dexter Hall, it was called, which was also, is also a North residence hall. Um, and it is the same building as is there now. And this is what the college looked like. So this is Todd's, the Todd lithograph from 1838, one of the first, the earliest views of the college that we have. Um, the, the view in the opening slide um, was the Todd lithograph or engraving from 1840. And we'll see some more later, but Dexter, Hall that he stayed in is all the way to the right, and I presume that's why it's Dexter Hall. Looking up the hill, it's the one furthest to the right, um, and it's also called North Residence Hall because it's the dorm furthest north. Here are his junior studies in each term, things that he was learning, and the the catalog for the following year, 1861 to 62, still lists Katie. So he presumably was planning, at least at some point, to come back on, uh, to, to, to campus. Um, and then because of the, the Civil War and his enlisting, he did not. And see also that this obituary, obituary record for 61, 62, which actually appeared in the 62, 63 catalog, starts listing obituaries of men killed in the Civil War. Uh, Crane and Camp on this page are listed. So here's another view of the, the college. Um, this is the Bradley engraving from 1847. And it, it hadn't changed very much between then and you know, 10, a little more than 10 years later when Rush Katie was there. Um, again, the, the one, the dorm farthest to the right is north. The dorm farthest to the left is south, where he was his first year. Well, south or Hamilton Hall, and north or Dexter Hall. <laughs> okay, and here's a stereograph of the chapel before the 1870s. But again, it would have looked much the same. And here's a view of Clinton from what is now the Rogers Estate. Um, it was at some point the Hawthorne Farm. Um, it, we can tell that it's after 1878 when the stone church was rebuilt, rebuilt with the tall spire. Because this tallest spire you see is the stone church, which was built in 1878. And it's before 1893 when St. James's steeple, which I believe is the one that you can see a little to the right of the stone church steeple, was blown down, 1893. Okay, so here now is the first page of one of the journals we have of him. The journal is dated February 5th, 1862, um, but he's talking at this point about college and his intention of keeping a journal in college. He says, from September 5th, uh, 57 to September 60, I was in the habit of keeping a daily record of occurrences and matters and things in general pertaining to myself, which occupied considerable time and with which I filled several books. But since that time, I have discontinued it entirely. I intended to keep a journal while I remained in college, at least, and afterwards if I should ever travel abroad. But though I did not leave college till about the middle of June 61, I was so closely occupied with my studies, extra German, junior oration, etc., that I couldn't conveniently spend the necessary time and hardly thought it worthwhile. Now we're going to go briefly back to the 
biography uh, for a summary. But if you want more detail, Russia's own journal would be the place to look. So the next pages of the biography talk about his efforts to join the military, which he succeeded in doing in the fall of 1861. His uncle, Gustavus M. Palmer, only two years older than Rush, was the captain of the company he joined. And one, I'll read one extract from this. When Colonel Charles Wheelock of Boonville, Oneida County, commenced recruiting the 97th Regiment New York Volunteers in the month of October 1861 to serve for three years or the war, his uncle, Captain G.M. Palmer, having been chosen a leader of Company K of this regiment, he enlisted as a private in his company, expecting to serve in that capacity. But as enlistments were tardy, he made great personal ex exertions to procure men for the company, and at its final organization was elected by the men second lieutenant, the commission bearing date the 18th day of February, 1861, uh, 62, sorry, 1862. He remained with the regiment at Boonville during the winter, not seeking ease for himself, but striving in many ways to improve the men in his company, drilling and forcing habits of cleanliness, when present upon the Sabbath, explaining portions of the Bible, taking papers for them, and trying to do his whole duty. So let's finish up looking at the bio. He became first lieutenant after Fredericksburg, after the discharge of the previous first lieutenant, September 24th, 1862. And the bio covers Gettysburg in half a paragraph. When the Great Battle of Gettysburg was fought, the 97th Regiment, being under General Reynolds, had a prominent part in the first day's fight. Lieutenant Cady, in the words of those who saw him, was as cool and collected as if no danger were near. And it was while bravely cheering and encouraging his men to still greater exertion near the close of the day's battle that he fell mortally wounded, a ball having passed through his right arm and entered, entering his body could not be extracted. He was taken to a private house in Gettysburg, received the best of care and attention from strangers and brother soldiers, and in a few days by his parents, but to no avail. He lingered suffering much until July 24th at 2 o'clock p.m. He yielded up his young life without a struggle just 23 days after he was so fatally wounded. But we're going to go back now to his journal dated February 1862. So he talks about after recruiting, he and Curran, who was his classmate at Hamilton, Henry Hastings Curran, who was to die in 1864 during the war, they brought their duly mustered recruits to Camp Scott on Staten Island. We received a pass to take us to Staten Island on the ferry. We had to march a mile and a half or two miles over a dusty road in a hot sun before we reached Camp Scott, where Sickles Brigade was encamped. The country through which we passed seemed almost a paradise. The scenery was so beautiful. Arrived at the encampment, it was a grand sight that greeted our eyes. About 3,800 men were here encamped. The white tents, arranged in parallel rows and covering a large extent of fine level ground. The busy throng of soldiers passing and repassing on the principal thoroughfare. The laugh, the shout, and the voice of command, distinct yet strangely mingled, mingling together. All these features and circumstances conspired to render the scene one of the most novel and interesting I ever witnessed. Our company was assigned to comfortable quarters in a wooden building just erected. As we had had no dinner, I bought a lot of cakes for the men. During the afternoon, I drilled them some. I had previously for a few days drilled them exclusively myself, and it was a matter of surprise to me that they had learned so readily. As far as they had gone, they were prompt and accurate. So his journal covers a lot of the bits of, of the war that he experienced. We're going to skip ahead to a journal entry dated December 13th, 1862, which describes some of the Battle of Fredericksburg from September. It's dated, you know, he wrote it in December, but he's um, recalling the battle a few months ago. The fight was a severe one. We were ordered to fall in line again, having been lying down in the field since about 7.30 a.m. at about 1.30 or 2. The shelling had been tremendous in the meantime. The skirmishers advanced and the whole line moved forward, skirmishes keeping up a rapid fire. At a short distance from the woods in our front, the line halted and commenced firing upon the Rebs who were in the edge of the woods. But we soon dashed forward upon a double quick with bayonets fixed. It says in the journal that he gave more details in his letters home so he wouldn't do that again in his journal. Here's another journal entry with more details of army life. He's describing a retreat here. Towards morning, it began to rain. 
Alec and I, having got pretty wet, blankets and all, thought best to get up out of the puddle, roll our blankets, and take it standing till morning. Having but a short time to make coffee and eat a hardtack or so, we marched early on Tuesday morning, December 16th, going about two and a half miles, where we encamped in a piece of woods. There's a lot more about marching in the mud and bivouacking in the rain, but also cheerful campfires, the luxury of sleeping on the floor by a fireplace when they are able to sleep in a house, getting paid, boxes from home. On page 46 of the diary, he says, Upon the 17th March, getting Dr. Little's horse, I set off about 9 a.m. to visit friends in the 14th, 50th, and other regiments. It was a pleasant day, the ground frozen hard in the morning, past camp after camp of troops, which were scattered all over the country for miles. Such a ride was well calculated to impress one with an exalted idea of the magnitude of the army, and yet I saw but a comparatively small part of it. In page 79, April, 3rd, uh, April 30th, 1863, our mules being green and very ugly, they kick off their loads, and it is difficult to repack them. And here's more in one of the, you know, we're getting towards Gettysburg, so this is one of his later letters, June 2nd, 1863. Rush is talking about applying to command a company of colored troops, which were commanded by white officers. The monotony of our camp routine has not been much broken lately, but I have to inform you of an important step upon my part, which will doubtless cause you some surprise, inasmuch as I have never intimated to you any such intention. And although you may not cordially approve the step, I hope you will not attempt to dissuade me from it. In connection with several other officers, I have made an application for the command of a company of colored troops. An order appeared in the Philadelphia Inquirer and Washington Chronicle of Thursday and Friday, 28th and 29th Alt, that means last month, which gave the necessary measures to be taken by those who wish to secure positions in colored regiments. For all those already in the service, it was necessary to accompany their letter of application with a certificate of their qualifications, fitness for command, good moral character, etc., signed by their commanding officers. These letters of application with certificates are sent to the Chief of Bureau for Colored Troops, care of the Adjutant General to whom they are presented for approval, and he forwards to such applicants in order to appear before the examining board at Washington at such a date to be examined as to their physical, mental, and moral fitness to command troops. I have little doubt that I can get the position of a captain, for which I consider myself just as capable as thousands of others. However, I would be quite willing to go into a colored regiment as first lieutenant and await the chances of promotion. Skipping a bit, the policy of organizing colored troops is an important one and is destined to be extensively developed. The government will watch with a jealous eye over the working of this policy and will take just pride in its success. Those who pass the examination satisfactorily will receive authority to recruit in certain districts throughout the northern and western states to which they may be assigned. Should I be so fortunate as to get recruiting authority, I would of course be able to spend some time during the summer in recruiting, which may be considered a great advantage, and might get a furlough to come home, which I have no hopes of getting here, as none are granted now. Quite a number of other officers have since made application, the idea seeming to have met with general favor. All the prejudices against the policy of arming the Negroes and organizing them into regiments having apparently melted away. Note that this would not have gotten, you know, if he'd been accepted as an as a officer for colored troops, he would not have therefore, therefore of, um, avoided Gettysburg because that wasn't, it wasn't happening until the summer. Um, and, but note also that, you know, he's eager to get home again. Okay, the last entry in his journal is for June 14th, 1863. And he says, Sunday, June 14th, 63, early made our coffee, ate our frugal breakfast, and started for the regiment, distant about half a mile. Division was bivouacked in a fine piece of woods on the right side of railroad, but a short distance from Yelton, Virginia, towards Rappahannock Station. Got a loaf of soft bread at the cams and a slice of ham of Colonel Wheelock so as to supply Alex, Haversack, and mine for the day. On the way to Bealton, we passed, passed portions of the Fifth Corps, which we understood was scattered along from below Falmouth nearly to Bealton. The Second and Third Corps lay near us. The Third marched ahead of us. Our division was in rear of the Corps. Did not get well underway before 10 o'clock. Passed through Warrenton. And 
here, right at the end of his journal, he has a sketch of Warrington Junction, um, probably from earlier, because he they, he was stationed near near Warrington earlier in the war. Now we reach Gettysburg. So here is after he's been wounded. This is July tenth. Dear parents, this is the first time I have attempted to write you a word since I was wounded. It is hard lying here so, hardly able to move around in bed. I am writing with my wounded arm. Can you see the difference? Oh, how I want to get home with you all. I miss the thousand and one little attentions of a mother and sister and grandmother. It is the same ball which went through my right arm, which went into my right lung, where it is lodged, not having been extracted. I am keeping up good courage. I am in a good place where my wants are well attended to. My warmest love to you all. How I would like to be received to your arms. Oh, pray for me, mother, that I may have grace and strength to endure my sufferings patiently, and that I may soon be returned to you. I can write no more now. Your son, Rush, P.C. Next, we have a letter from Gustavus, his uncle, also on June, the June 10th. Uh, the part about Rush is, I have time to write but a line. Rush is doing well on the gain, I think. He has some fever, but not as much. I can see nothing in the way of his getting along, but he is very low, and it will be a good while before he will get up around again. But then on July 20th, there's a telegraph from Gustavus to Rush's parents. It just says, Rush wants you to come immediately. And then on the right on this slide is the beginning of uh, Rush's mother's letter. This is Fidelia. Uh, to to her husband. She says, my dear husband, this is on, on the 23rd, July 23rd. My dear husband, I leave Rush a few minutes to write. Mrs. Hill sits by him. I hardly know what to say. We moved him yesterday. He stood it as well as we expected, but he was very miserable last night. His nerves all unstrung. You can have no idea how low and weak he is. We feed him wine and stimulants constantly, bathe him off in brandy and liquor often. We keep doing constantly. The hospital steward stayed last night with Gustavus. He is one of the kindest and best of men from Boonville. The hospital physician came to, and a resident one here. We expect Dr. Chambers today. We are doing everything we can and make him almost as comfortable as he, going on here, as he could be anywhere from home. But my heart aches so sometimes. We have no ice now. He said this morning, I want a piece of ice as long as the end of my thumb. Ah, when we have it at home, so plenty. Still, we have lemonade, quite cool. He complains not a sound, so good to take his medicine. He said to me yesterday, Kiss me, mother, pray for me. Said his, nar his mind had been dark and cloudy, considerable, but the Lord had always been with him when he was sick. He talks very feeble. Oh, my husband, can we part with our dear brave boy? May God give us grace to bear all we may be called upon to do. Pray for me and him too, husband, mother and child. But he may live, we have great hopes yet. So many of his soldier brothers so kind, and the people too. I talked with the lady into whose home he was brought the day he was wounded. She said he suffered terribly, groaning all the time. The sur surgeon did not think he would live. She asked if he, he had a family. He says, oh no, I was a schoolboy. I am only 21. Oh, that my mother or sister were here. The next day he was more comfortable. If his grandmother could only sit by his bed, but he likes Mrs. Hill. Rufus, the servant, is here waiting upon us. Can do anything, a good boy. Gustavus thinks I might better take him home with me. He can take care of horses and loves children. In fact, can do almost anything a good a young girl could do. But I do not know if it would be best. What do you think of it? Could I get him through without any trouble? We allow no one to see Rush, only those that take care of him. All the missing and suffering here. How many mothers here came to find their sons? Some died the day before, and considerable other in the hospitals suffering. And... It gets too faint to read at that point. So there's this composition, Letters from Gettysburg by Avner Dorman, which was written in 2013 to commemorate the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. And Dorman uses phrases from Russia's letter, letters, the one right at the end, and uh, from Fidelia's letters home to her husband, and I am going to play a few 
bits of this composition from for you so you can hear what what has been done first section from Fidelia's letter the words are kiss me mother pray for me and but the Lord never left my side So that last bit was mother, sister, sit by me, and oh, that my mother and or sister were here. And then we're going to skip ahead to another bit where it has quite a lot of Russia's letter, um, you know, saying this is the first time I have attempted to write you a word since I was wounded. Let's see, 1405 first starting.
so the last bit was um, I am keeping up good courage I am in a good place oh pray for me mother that I may have grace and strength I can write no more now and then one more short bit from 23, 12. This is for So there's some extracts from this composition that uses uh, Russia's words and his mother's words about him. So that's it. Thank you. And thank you very much to the Katie family relatives for their generosity and to Hamilton College for all of the resources. And next we will be able to take questions. So there we are. <laughs> I understand the sound wasn't great in some of those bits, uh, my husband was telling me. Um, so I hope you could hear it all right. Yes. Okay. Good. So are there any questions? <laughs> I'll do my best to answer them. I'll start the ball rolling here, Kathy. Um, in terms of the... Um, I mean, I live in Oneida, so Clockville, I'm very familiar with where that is and its proximity just literally up the road from Peterborough. Uh, I wondered if there was any speculation. I know you said you weren't a, a biographer of, of him, mm -hmm. but his proximity to Peterborough and Garrett Smith and the whole abolitionist movement, mm -hmm. care to speculate as to whether that had a bearing on his choice of a assignment with a Afro-American regiment? Oh, um, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it was in the air around around here. Um, so maybe, I don't know. It, that would be interesting to, to study. Yes, for certain. Can I? Um, go ahead, somebody. Yeah. Uh, this, this is uh, Bob Katie. I was in the class of 67 at Hamilton College. My dad was in the class of, of uh, 1940. My dad's uh, grandfather and my great grandfather's name was Hiram Palmer Cady. He was born in Lebanon, New York, about 25 miles from Clockville, from where Rush was born. So my dad always said, "Oh, he's our cousin." You know, he he, he never really looked into it. Um, I actually looked into it because I was really interested, and it's actually pretty much a coincidence. He, they, we are, and the, the people that are really closely related to Rush and who have donated material is Janet Johnson, who's right below me, and, and, and the Barnes family, Cynthia Barnes in New Hartford. Um, so my, my uh, interest in looking into this, uh, I it came across a book, The Descendants of Nicholas Cady, uh, who immigrated to uh, Watertown, Massachusetts in 1645. There are about 5,000 descendants of, of, uh, of Nicholas Cady. And what happened was in, I wrote this down, in, in November, in 1738 in Storrington, Connecticut, um, 
Aaron and Ebenezer Cady married Anna and Prudence Palmer, two brothers married two sisters. Because of that, that's 1738, there are lots of Palmer Cady's. Cool. We're, in there, we're in there somewhere, but we're not really closely related to Rush. But the other thing that I really found that I, uh, when, when I was looking into this that I think is really fantastic is he was pretty closely related to Elizabeth Cady Stanton. I, I don't think, I don't know, I have no idea whether, whether he ever made it to Peterborough or not, but, um, but, he, but, but, but in this book with 5,000 descendants, the two superstars are Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Rush Palmer Cady, and there's a bunch of other businessmen and, and, and stuff in there. So I don't know that, and I never knew, uh, um, by the way, Kathy, thank you so much, that was absolutely fantastic. I never knew that he applied to be right. an officer of a colored regiment. I didn't know that. That's I didn't amazing. know that until I was doing this, you know, reading those diary entries and letters. <laughs> you know, the timing of that would be around when the, the 54th Massachusetts was formed and Rob Shaw, the guy, the hero in the, in the movie Glory that at the Battle of Fort Wagner, it would be around that time. It was just before Gettysburg that the 54th Massachusetts. So that's a question we'll have to ask Professor Isserman about. Yeah, I don't think Professor Isserman came, but he can certainly be asked. <laughs> well, well I, I, I'm glad for your input there because I was wondering what the uh, connection was. Um, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad to hear that. It's I, I recently uh, finished a book, a Civil War book. Um, uh, uh, it, it was mostly, mostly um, first person uh, narratives. But one of the things about the, the colored regiments, uh, is some, of the, some of the people who applied to be officers apparently um, did it out of idealism which uh, uh, judging from w what I've learned here today, uh, I, 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 I lean that way uh, with uh, Rush Katie, uh, but it was also regarded as a quick way to advance in the officer corps to, to, to get a, um, you know, it, that a commission that you weren't gonna get uh, it, it, through normal channels. So uh, some of the people who applied to be, um, uh, officers in the colored regiments were were looking for an easy way to move up the ranks mm -hmm. yeah and i mean it, rush did say he'd be fine just being a first lieutenant but you know he probably would also have you know have liked the promotion but it seemed like also you know from earlier that the summer of um 1861 when he was helping gustavus do the recruiting he seemed he he liked the recruiting Part, you know, better than the fighting part. Um, so, and he talks in that letter about the recruiting that, you know, he would be sent out to do the recruiting. Um, and so that seems like, you know, that was an additional uh, drive to, you know, okay, I can do recruiting instead of fighting. That would be great. Um, but, you know, there, you know, there was at least a little bit of idealism there too, I think. Well, I, I'm sure, I, I'm sure there was. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and also Elizabeth Cady Stanton, was she not uh, uh, related to um, um, Mr. Uh, why am I having the guy Garrett, from Peterborough? Garrett, Garrett Smith? Garrett Smith? Rush. Garrett Smith. Was she not related to him? She's Garrett uh, Smith's cousin. Pardon she's, me? She's Garrett Smith's cousin. Right. She okay, spent, good. Yeah. She spent, summers, she spent all her summers in Peterborough and she got a lot of her social. Uh, ideas from him. She, in fact, her her first boy, I think his name is 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 uh, Garrett Smith, Katie. Who, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, um, uh, I have to do the class analyst letter for the class of 1970, and uh, Garrett Smith. So I'm looking. I've read many, many of the ones going away. The first one was 1865, and I don't know. I'm not sure if Garrett Smith wrote that one or 1866. I think he was 1866. But I'm going like, holy cow, yeah. I got to follow up like a guy like yeah. He was in the class of 1818. All right, so it would have been, he, he would have delivered it in 18. He was a valedictorian. He, 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 oh, yeah, well, yeah, there's only six or seven guys, though, right, Bob? Only six or seven <laughs> guys. <laughs> but he also oh, married even, the president. I would have had a chance then. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I still wouldn't have. Had. But uh, he married the, he married the president's daughter too. He married the daughter of uh, his name was like Aza Bacchus or something. Uh, Aza Bacchus was the first president, right? Yeah. He, so so Agar Smith married married his daughter. Well, yeah. was her name? Uh, Delta. I can't remember. Do you remember? I don't Delta. know. W e a l t h a, I believe. I just want to one, one, mention one other thing. Uh, you, you know, we love the name Palmer Katie. So my youngest boy, his name is Jeffrey Palmer Katie. Cool. And Jeff is about forty-two, and he's a great kid. And and, and it's interesting because he has a lot of uh, he has a lot of a lot of Rush's uh, uh, character. He's a he's he's a good kid. Kathy, I just want to say thank you so much for this presentation. Um, it was very interesting, and I did learn a lot, too. Um, as a child, my dad talked very proudly about two Katie members, Elizabeth Katie Stanton and, and Rush. And um, I finally figured out how they were related. And it is Bob from, good to see you too, Bob. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the Nicholas Katie book, the uh, Elizabeth Katie Stanton's grandfather and my fifth great grandfather were brothers. Wow. So they go back, we have that common ancestor, their father, uh, but um, they certainly lived geographically in the same area and were very much deep thinkers. Um, as you read Rush from the time he was a teenager, he was very serious and very, you know, he had, he would write at length about the sermons that, that he heard. And um, he was just, as I told you, Kathy, to me, it's just but one example of the tremendous loss that we suffer when we go to war, when we can't end things civilly. <laughs> and um, this young man had so much promise. Right. And he, he d doubtless would have married Bob and we would have had lots of more descendants there. Um, but it's just a tremendous loss of someone so principled and but he said and i can't find it but at one point he said i would give my own right arm for the cause of liberty and he literally did right um and it uh it just gives us all pause that we can't break this cycle <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to this day <laughs> Yeah, but I, hopefully saner minds will prevail. Yeah. I noticed that, he, you know, he talks about, I quoted one of the bits where he's talking about writing to Hattie Clark and, and another time when she, when he, you know, she was one of mm -hmm. the girls around with, and there were several other mentions of Hattie Clark and other girls too, but I did wonder, you know, if he'd survived, would she have been married? Um, and also, I know, you know, with when he talks about Bell, his little sister being so sick and, you know, not expected to live in, I was like, well, uh, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> wouldn't be here. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I thought That's about right. that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much. Yes, and thank it's you. a pleasure to Thanks. see. I'm part of the Roswell Historical Society. And so we, as a matter of fact, our archivist, Elaine De Niro, is on this call, I see. I um, so, uh, and, um, and she's originally from Pennsylvania. So uh, we're, we're, we're here in Roswell, Georgia, but we're still looking through all the archives. <laughs> Kathy, can I just say, just say one last thing? Sure. There in the back of the Hamilton College Chapel are beautiful bronze plaques of all the Hamilton men that uh, were killed in World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. It, but there wasn't one for the Civil War. There is now, and Russia's name is there. But it hasn't been dedicated yet. And Janet and I kind of organized this thing. We were going we were gonna have a dedication last April. Last April, on the, yes. <laughs> yeah, it was gonna be the anniversary of um, of uh, Lee surrendered to Grant, which was which was. Oh, I've lost sound. Bob, we lost. Okay. Sound. We lost your sound, Bob. I, am I back on now? Yes. Yeah. Yep. 
Okay. You're in. So uh, I, I was hoping maybe we could do it on the anniversary of Gettysburg this summer in July. I, I haven't. I, th there was going to be an email going out, and I don't know if uh, if we'll all be vaccinated for that to happen. Maybe we'll have to wait longer. Hmm. Yeah, but yeah, that we could hope for that anyway. Yeah, right. that'd be great. Well, I I, I get, go ahead. Go ahead, John. John. I, I just looked at those plaques maybe a few weeks ago, Bob, and um, um, I was actually a class was going on in the chapel. People widely spread out, and I, I just was in there for a minute. And you know what? Every time I go in there, I, I look at the plaques in the back, and still, they all kind of hit me in the face. You know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to look at. I just got to say, I'm sorry, I'm talking too much, but I have to say one last thing. Uh, one of my classmates, Ken Hurst's name is there. He was killed in Vietnam. And, uh, you know, that was so many years ago. And I was trying to, I Googled it one time, uh, maybe five or six years ago. And believe it or not, what comes up is Ken's sister reading letters that he wrote home at a Memorial Day ceremony in San Francisco. Exactly, exactly the same thing we're doing here. And, uh, yeah. Well, again, I want to thank uh, Kathy uh, for a fantastic, uh, moving, very informational uh, presentation. And I can't wait to see what you got coming next year. How's that for putting a hook in? We'll see. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, 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 for, everyone else, for everyone else, uh, please stay tuned. February 7th and 21st is our next program. And uh, we'll be doing our best to get this recording onto both Facebook and our YouTube channels. So, uh, with that, uh, bid you a, a fond farewell for Sunday. And again, thank you so much for your time. Thanks a lot, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye. Bye. Great to see you, Bob. You too, buddy. <laughs>